picking up where we left off last time, he looked around the circle of eager faces. There was no lack of boys to choose from. And Simon. The boys round Simon giggled, and he stood up, laughing a little. Now that the pallor of his faint was over, he was a skinny, vivid little boy with a glance coming up from under a hut of straight hair that hung down, black and coarse. He nodded at Ralph. I'll come. And I, Jack snatched from behind him a sizable sheath knife and clouded it into a trunk. The buzz rose and died away. Piggy stirred. I'll come. Ralph turned to him. You're no good on a job like this. All the same. We don't want you, said Jack flatly. Three's enough. Piggy's glasses flashed. Again, we see Piggy's glasses flashing. They're reflecting in the sun a lot, and that's because his glasses are an important symbol. That's why they keep being emphasized, okay? They represent the intelligence and the logic on the island, and the other boys don't like him, and they don't like the rules. So Jack especially does not like Piggy, and Piggy is going to stay at home. And we see Jack has this knife, um, again, connotations, the violence, the brutality of that, we see that represented with the knife and we'll see that again and again. So right now we have Ralph, Jack, and Simon are going to be the three who go to explore the island. Okay. I was with him when I find the, found the conch. I was with him before anyone else was. Jack and the others paid no attention. There was a general dispersal. Ralph, Jack, and Simon jumped off the platform and walked along the sand past the bathing pool. Piggy hum bump, hung bumbling behind them. If Simon walks in the middle of us, said Ralph, then we could talk over his head. The three of them fell into step. This meant that every now and then, Simon had to do a double, double shuffle to catch up with the others. Presently, Ralph stopped and turned back to Piggy. Look, Jack and Simon pretended to notice nothing. They walked on. You can't come. Piggy's glasses were misted again, this time with humiliation. You told him after what I said. His face flushed and his mouth trembled. After I said I didn't want, what on earth are you talking about? About being called Piggy. I said I don't care as long as they don't call me Piggy. And I said not to tell. And then you went and said straight out, stillness descended on them. Ralph, looking with more understanding at Piggy, saw that he was hurt and crushed. He hovered between the two courses of apology or further insult. Better Piggy than Fatty, he said at last with the directness of genuine leadership. But anyway, I'm sorry if you feel like that. Now go back, Piggy, and take names. That's your job. So long. He turned and raced after the other two. Piggy stood and the rose of indignation faded slowly from his cheeks. He went back to the platform. The three boys walked briskly on the sand. The tide was low and there was a strip of weed-strewn beach that was almost as firm as a road. A kind of glamour was spread over them and the scene and they were conscious of the glamour and made happy by it. They turned to each other, laughing excitedly, talking, not listening. The air was bright. Ralph, faced by the task of translating all this into explanation, stood on his head and fell over. When they had done laughing, Simon stroked Ralph's arm shyly, and they had to laugh again. Come on, said Jack presently. We're explorers. Again, thinking of connotation, look at all the positive things going on here. It's glamorous. They're happy. They're laughing. The air is bright. They're doing handstands. It's all one big adventure. They're explorers. Everything is really positive still right now. We'll get to the end of the island, said Ralph, and look around the corner, if it is an island. Now, toward the end of the afternoon, the mirages were settling a little. They found the end of the island quite distinct and not magicked out of shape or sense. There was a jumble of the usual squareness, with one great block sitting out in the lagoon. Seabirds were nesting there. Like icing, said Ralph, on a pink cake. We shan't see round this corner, said Jack, because there isn't one, only a slow curve. And you can see the rocks got worse. Ralph shaded his eyes and followed the jagged outline of the crags towards the mountain. This part of the beach was nearer the mountain than any other they had seen. We'll try climbing the mountain from here, he said. I should think this is the easiest way. There's less of that jungly stuff and more pink rock. Come on. 
The three boys began to scramble up. Some unknown force had wrenched and shattered these cubes so that they lay askew, often piled diminishingly on one another. The most unusual feature of the rock was a pink cliff surrounded, surmounted by a skewed block, and that again surmounted, and that again, till the pinkness became a stack of balanced rock projecting through the looped fantasy of the forest creepers. Where the pink cliffs rose out of the ground, there were often narrow tracks winding upwards. They could edge along them deep in the plant world, their faces to the rock. What made this track? Jack paused, wiping the sweat from his face. Ralph stood by him breathless. Men? Jack shook his head. Animals. Ralph peered into the darkness under the trees. The forest minutely vibrated. Come on. The difficulty was not the steep ascent round the shoulders of rock, but the occasional plunges through the undergrowth to get to the next path. Here the roots and stems of creepers were in such tangles that the boys had to thread through them like pliant needles. Their only guide, apart from the brown ground and the occasional flashes of light through the foliage, was the tendency of the slope. Whether this hole, laced as it was with the cables of creeper, stood higher than that. Somehow, they moved up. Immured in these tangles, at perhaps their most difficult moment, Ralph turned with shining eyes to the others. Wacko! Wizard! Smashing! The cause of their pleasure was not obvious. All three were hot, dirty, and exhausted. Ralph was badly scratched. The creepers were as thick as their thighs and left but little tunnels for further penetration. Ralph shouted experimentally and they listened to the muted echoes. This is real exploring, said Jack. I bet nobody's been here before. We ought to draw a map, said Ralph, only we haven't any paper. We could make scratches on bark, said Simon, and rub black stuff in. Against came the solemn communion of shining eyes in the gloom. Wacko, wizard. There is no place for standing on one's head. This, Ralph, this time Ralph expressed the intensity of his emotion by pretending to knock Simon down. And soon they were a happy heaving pile in the underdusk. When they had fallen apart, Ralph spoke first. Got to get on. The pink granite of the next cliff was farther back from the creepers and the trees so that they could trot up the path. This again led into more open forest so that they had a glimpse of the spread sea. With openness came the sun. It dried the sweat that had soaked their clothes in the dark, damp heat. At last, the way to the top looked like a scramble over pink rock with no more plunging through the darkness. The boys chose their way through defiles and over heaps of sharp stone. Look, look! High over this end of the island, the shattered rocks lifted up their stacks and chimneys. This one, against which Jack leaned, moved with a grating sound when they pushed. Come on, but not come on to the top. The assault on the summit must wait while the three boys accepted this challenge. The rock was as large as a small motor car. Heave! Sway back and forth, catch the rhythm. Heave! Increase the swing of the pendulum. Increase, increase, come up and bear against that point of furthest balance. Increase, increase, heave! The great rock loitered poised on one toe, decided not to return, moved through the air, fell, struck, turned over, leapt droning through the air, and smashed a deep hole in the canopy of the forest. Echoes and birds flew, pink and white dust floated, and the forest further down shook as with the passage of an enraged monster. And then the island was still. Wacko, like a bomb, meow. Not for five minutes could they drag themselves away from this triumph, but they left at last. The way to the top was easy after that, and as they reached the last stretch, Ralph stopped. Golly, they were on top of a lip of a circular hollow in the side of the mountain. This was filled with a blue flower, a rock plant of some sort, and the overflow hung down the vent and spilled lavishly among the canopy of the forest. The air was thick with butterflies, lifting, fluttering, settling. Beyond the hollow was the square top of the mountain, and soon they were standing on it. They had guessed before that this was an island, clambering among the pink rocks with the sea on either side and the crystal heights of air. 
They had known by some instinct that the sea lay on every side, but there seemed something more fitting in leaving this last word until they stood on top and could see a circular horizon of water. Ralph turned to the others. This belongs to us. It was roughly boat shaped, humped near the end with behind them the jumbled descent to the shore. On either side, rocks, cliffs, treetops, and a steep slope. Forward there, the length of the boat, a tamer descent, tree clad with hints of pink, and then the jungly flat of the island, dense green, but drawn at the end to a pink tail. There, where the island petered out in the water, was another island, a rock almost detached, standing like a fort, facing them across the green with a bold pink bastion. The boys surveyed all this, then looked out to sea. They were high up and the afternoon had advanced. The view was not robbed of sharpness by mirage. That's a reef, a coral reef. I've seen pictures like that. The reef enclosed more than one side of the island, lying perhaps a mile out and parallel to what they now thought of as their beach. The coral was scribbled in the sea as though a giant had bent down to reproduce the shape of the island in a flowing chalk line but tired before he finished. Inside was peacock water, rocks and weeds showing as in an aquarium. Outside was the dark blue sea. The tide was running so that long streaks of foam tra tailed away from the reef, and for a moment they felt that the boat was moving steadily astern.